Well, we've been spending a lot of time on the garage mechanics lately. Let me review for you where things stand. First, we talked about variational calculus, and we looked at the geometric nature of a variational problem, where we tried to do things like minimize a path length on a flat surface, or maybe even a curved surface. We looked at catenaries and brachistochrone problems, the soap bubble stuff. And then we started to apply it to uh, Lagrangian mechanics. And the way we did that was we turned our objective function, that was the kernel of our integral, we called it f, I think, most of the time. We, we traded that in for the Lagrangian, the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And then our integral, instead of being over a, uh, a path length in space, was over uh, a time, so an interval of time between t1 and t2. And we called this integral the action, s. And we looked for stationary points in the action, the variation in s equal to zero. And that gave us the Lagrangian version of the Euler-Lagrange equations. And we identified it as a generalized force balance, Fi equals Pi dot, where F is a generalized force and P is a generalized momentum. And I might you know, range from one to N. We might have a whole bunch of these equations all coupled. We solved a couple of problems with that approach. For instance, the one degree of freedom simple pendulum problem, where we were just tracking an equation of motion for theta as a function of time. And we got some familiarity with how to develop and apply these Lagrange equations. The next step was pretty tricky, though. What we did was identified situations where our variables of interest were dependent. So we redid the pendulum problem, but treated it as if it was a two degree of freedom problem. And then we had to introduce a constraint equation. W, a function of x and y, say, is equal to zero. In the case of the pendulum problem, we found that this additional constraint equation allowed us to develop a, an expression for the force on the pin about which the pendulum swung. And I argued that one of the utilities of having these constraint equations and dependent variables was that you could develop very targeted analyses of forces that you were interested in. But this left us with a couple of questions. One, how do we generalize this approach so that we can include more than one constraint equation? And then two, and maybe this is the real question is, what the heck is this Lagrange multiplier lambda anyway? Is there some physical interpretation for this? I mean, in the pendulum problem, we were able to show that it was proportional to the components of force. But in general, it would be better to have a kind of a gut physical sense for what the Lagrange multipliers are really trying to tell us. I'll try to answer those questions today. Let's first take up the idea of multiple constraints. Here I've written down the action integral in terms of the Lagrangian L and our variables of interest are Q1 through say Qn, maybe some large number. And let's pretend that there are really only m degrees of freedom, where m is less than the number of variables that I've identified, that's n. And that means that I need to introduce constraint equations. The number of constraint equations that I need will be the number of variables minus the number of degrees of freedom. In other words, n minus m. And so I'm going to need that many constraint equations, that many w's, and each of the w's, say wj, is going to be a function of the positions and is equal to zero. So now I have n minus m constraint equations and n Lagrange equations. For each constraint equation, I'll have a Lagrange multiplier, lambda j, say. And you can see that in the Lagrange equations. So now I have n variables that I'm solving for, and in addition, n minus m Lagrange multipliers that I need to solve for. OK, big set of equations. That's the first issue that I wanted to take up. And I'll give you a chance in class to see problems associated with multiple constraints. Let me take up a second issue now. And it's the kind of the geometric understanding of what this Lagrange multiplier idea is really doing for us. So I'm going to simplify the problem by taking out any time dependence. And because this is a 
associated with problems much more general than Lagrangian mechanics, I'll go back to the notation of f for our kernel instead of the Lagrangian. So now I'm just trying to minimize some integral over this objective function. So all I'm doing is taking this original box expression, replacing L by F, and dumping the last term, that DDT of DL DQI dot. All right, let's do an example problem to see how this set of equations works. Let's suppose that we wanted to find the shape of a box, a 3D box, that has a minimum surface area, but a fixed volume, call it V naught. And the objective function is then the total area of this box. So twice each of the sides, xy plus yz plus zx. All right, that's f, and we want to minimize that subject to the constraint of constant volume v0. How many variables do we have in this problem? Well, it looks like three, x, y, and z. How many degrees of freedom do we have? The answer to that is two, because of the constraint of fixed volume. I can only change two side lengths, and then the third length is uh, determined. Okay, so we're going to need to come up with one constraint equation. I'll call it W of XYZ is equal to V naught minus XYZ, and that's what has to be equal to zero for all of the XYZs that we consider. Here I want to identify something. This V naught will come to be known as a constraint variable, and eventually I'm going to call this zeta. But for right now, it's just an advertisement for a new feature down the road. Let's go on with the problem. I first apply the Euler-Lagrange equation at left for x, y, and z to get three equations. And now I have these three, and I add to them a fourth equation. That's my constraint equation written in this x, y, z equals v naught form. So I have four equations, and I have four unknowns, x, y, z, and lambda. And I can solve these equations for the unknowns. Now the truth is that you could go through and, without any intuition, solve these equations, but you also kind of have a strong geometric intuition that the answer is going to be when x and y and z are all equal to each other. And so I'll assume that that's true, and I'll figure out what the side length must be, and then show that that satisfies all four equations. Nothing beats being a good guesser. Based on this idea of symmetry, x, y, and z must all be equal to v naught to the one third. And if I put that into the any of the first three equations, I'll find that they're satisfied as long as lambda is equal to x over four, or v naught to the one third over four. Okay, so we have a solution. We don't know what this Lagrange multiplier really means, the v naught to the one third over four. I'll get to that down the road, but. At least what I've shown here with this simple example problem is that the Lagrange multiplier does deliver for us the solution to our constrained equilibrium problem. Now, we already did one of these with the pendulum and Lagrange mechanics. All I'm doing here is pointing out that the same idea can be used, this idea of using constraints, in problems associated with geometry optimization as well. And the reason I'm doing that is so that you can develop a better sense for what the Lagrange multipliers are really doing. Now we can take up this idea of interpretation of Lagrange multipliers directly. And the way I'm going to frame this is within a particularly important setting where the constraint equations are of a particular form. And I mentioned this before. Most of the time, in fact, for every single example I've given you so far, our constraint function w is of the form of zeta minus, call it w tilde, where zeta is some constraint variable and w tilde is the rest of the constraint function. For instance, in the last problem, I had that v naught minus x, y, z was equal to zero. In that case, the constraint variable was v naught and w tilde is equal to x, y, z. Go back and look at the pendulum. We had the exact same kind of thing. The argument that I want to make is that the Lagrange multiplier is a measure of the sensitivity of our objective function, f, to a change in the associated constraint variable. In fact, I'll argue that lambda is equal to df d zeta. Some of you have asked if these variational concepts that we've been developing are more general than the integral settings in which we've applied them. And the answer I've always said is yes. 
And here's an example of where I can interpret Lagrange multipliers much more broadly than that integral setting. So instead of having an integral setting, I'm just going to say, suppose that we want to find a stationary point for some function f, subject to the constraints that w is equal to zero. Without any integrals involved, that amounts to minimizing some function phi that depends on the q's and the lambdas and is composed of a sum of the objective function f plus our Lagrange multiplier times its associated constraint variable. Notice here that all I've done is written the constraint function w in terms of zeta minus w tilde. Oh, let me also point out a little bit of notation here. I'll have a big list of q1, q2, etc., and I'll call that q underbar and treat it like it's a little vector. The same thing for the list of lambdas, lambda 1, lambda 2, etc. I'll group them all together and call that a vector lambda underbar. It just makes the notation a little bit more compact. All right, so I'm just trying to minimize this function phi. That's the bottom line. So for some particular problem, we would combine these Euler-Lagrange equations with the constraint equations to solve for all the q's and all the lambdas. But that's not what I'm going to do here. I'm after interpretation of lambda. So instead, what I want to do is focus on this equation 2 and say, suppose that we had solved for all the, the lambdas and the q's, and we identify the set of q's that optimize these equations as q star under bar. Remember, this is a vector list of all of the, the q's that are required to optimize these equations. So for a given set of constraint variables, remember these are things like L or V0, I can solve these equations and get the q's. And so I can get f of q. But wait a minute. That means that this final function, f of q, depends on what those constraint variables are. After all, if I change the length or I change the volume, then my answer is going to change. And so I can think of little f, which normally is a function of the q's, as being a function of the zetas, the constraint variable set, at this optimum point. And in fact, I'm going to define a capital F, a function of the constraint variable vector, as being equal to the objective function at this optimum set of values of q, q star. Okay, why, why do that? It's because now I can take the derivative of this capital F with respect to an arbitrary con constraint variable, zeta i. And then I can apply the chain rule to that and write it as a sum of partial derivatives of F times partial derivatives of Q, thinking of Q themselves as being dependent on the zetas. Well, now we can use equation two to replace those partial derivatives of F with respect to the QJ. And it gives us a pretty ugly double summation expression. But I claim that this can be simplified a huge amount. And here's how to do it. Take the derivative of the constraint equations. That's equation one. And when I do that, I have an expression for the partial derivative of each of the zetas with respect to each of the q's. Now put that into the equation above for the derivative of capital F with respect to zeta i. And what I'm left with is a funny looking thing. It's a sum over the j's and k's of a lambda k times, look at this, it's the derivative of zeta k with respect to qj times the derivative of qj with respect to zeta i. Now zeta can only depend on the q's. So if I sum over the all of those j terms, this amounts to saying I'm taking the partial derivative of zeta k with respect to zeta i. Well, those are going to be equal to zero unless k is equal to i. These constraints are all independent. And so I'm left with just a delta function for that ki term. And now I have the sum over k of lambda k times delta i k. Ah, oh, but wait a minute. That's just a Kronecker delta, so I'm left with lambda i. All right, this is what I claimed would be true. And it's almost as if I had peeked at the notes. Lambda i is now equal to the derivative of capital F with respect to zeta i.
But what does this really mean? Remember that capital F is just the same as our original objective function, little f. It's only that we wrote it in terms of the constraint variable zeta instead of the variables of the original problem, q. So what this is saying is that the Lagrange multiplier, lambda, is the rate of change of the objective function, f, for a change in the constraint variable, zeta. It's the sensitivity of the objective function with respect to our constraint variable. So think of the, the volume problem. This is saying how much does our objective function change when we change v naught, the volume of the problem, or the length of the string in the pendulum case. Here, lambda and zeta have an intimate relationship, and we call them conjugate variables. You'll see in thermodynamics later on that these two are also called Legendre transforms of each other. Let's do an example problem to test our understanding of this derivation of lambda. Okay, here it is. Suppose that you can shoot a particle up in the air, and you can shoot it at any direction that you want, with any velocity components that you want, so long as the kinetic energy of the system is fixed at E naught. And your goal is to maximize the range. So we'll call that objective function, f, the range that you attain, that's the horizontal distance, when you fire this projectile. All right, we need to maximize f subject to a constraint. And the constraint is that the kinetic energy is equal to E naught. That's 1 half m times V naught X squared plus V naught Y squared. All right, what are the variables that we're using in the Lagrangian dynamics? It's V naught X and V naught Y. Are they coupled? Yes, they're constrained by this kinetic energy requirement. So I'm gonna have two equations that are Lagrangian plus a constraint. Let's work them out. Our first step is to get F, and to do that, I'll need to write the range in terms of the velocity components. The projectile moves at a constant horizontal velocity, so the range is just going to be v naught x times the total time of flight. All I really need to do then is get that total time of flight, capital T. And I'll use the constant acceleration in the y direction to calculate the time of flight. So y is equal to y naught plus v naught y times t plus a naught y over 2 times t squared. But the initial position is y equals 0. The final position is y equals 0 and the acceleration in the y direction is just that associated with gravity, g. So I can solve this constant acceleration equation for the time of flight t. 2 times v naught y divided by g. Good. Now I can put that into the equation for the range. The velocity times the time is just twice v naught x times v naught y divided by g. That's the objective function that I'm trying to minimize subject to my energy constraint. Well, here's my constraint equation in terms of the velocity components, just the constraint variable, E naught, that's my zeta, right, minus 1 half mv squared. Good. Now I can set up my phi. Phi is the objective function plus the constraint equation times lambda. And I want to minimize phi. And so I take the derivative of phi with respect to v naught x and v naught y, and I have my two Lagrange equations. And the third equation is just the constraint equation. So I have three equations and three unknowns. And if I solve those, I'll find that the optimal velocity components are both equal to the square root of e naught over m. And when I use those to solve for the Lagrange multiplier, I'll get that the Lagrange multiplier, lambda, is 2 divided by mg. All right, now I'm going to use this to test my sensitivity derivation. What is lambda? We said that lambda was equal to the derivative of the objective function with respect to the constraint variable. So let's write the objective function in terms of the constraint variable. That's capital F written as a function of the constraint variable energy naught, okay, E naught. So here it is, capital F is just twice v naught x times v naught y divided by g. 
that is how we wrote the objective function in the first place. Go back and look at little f. Now I substitute in the optimal values, that's what the stars mean, and I get an expression for capital F. Take the derivative of this with respect to E naught, and what do you get? You get 2 divided by mg. But hey, that's exactly what we anticipated because we have already solved for lambda. So here's what we can say, is that lambda in this problem is indeed equal to the derivative of the objective function with respect to the constraint variable. Good. Next I'm going to discuss three different fields of study in which Lagrange multipliers play a prominent role. The first one is thermodynamics, and it may not look like it, but I can talk about thermodynamics within a spring mass setting. Let's just consider a single mass, M, attached to a spring, K, no gravity here, and I'm measuring the displacement variable, Q. I apply a force, F0, a constant valued force, to the right, and I look for equilibrium positions of the particle. Well, we know there's only one. And to get it, we're going to minimize the potential energy of the system. We could think of this thermodynamically as the internal energy. And the constraint is that the system is in equilibrium. And so the sum of the forces is equal to zero. F plus F0 is zero, where F is the restoring force. Remember, that's equal to minus K times Q. The internal energy, U, is just equal to 1 half kq squared. The constraint equation is going to be F0 minus kq, and here you should be able to identify F0 as our constraint variable, zeta. And we want to minimize phi, which is equal to the sum of these two things with W multiplied by lambda. All right, so I look at that, I take the derivative with respect to q, set it equal to zero, and solve. And I find that lambda is equal to q. But just from the constraint equation alone, I can see that q in equilibrium must be equal to f naught over k. That means that lambda is equal to f naught over k. All right, the intent wasn't to solve for the equilibrium position, it was to interpret the Lagrange multiplier. And we want to show that lambda is equal to d capital F d zeta. All we have to do is identify capital F. Well, that's just the objective function. And the objective function here is the internal energy of the system, u. And I just need to evaluate it at q equal to its equilibrium position. That's F naught over k. So I take the derivative of this internal energy with respect to F naught, and I get F naught over K. But in fact, that is equal to lambda. So we've demonstrated once again that lambda does have a physical interpretation. It's the sensitivity of the objective function with respect to a change in the constraint variable. And in this case, the constraint variable is F naught. Let me also point out in passing that we've minimized a particular function, and in the abstract we called it phi. Here, it has a physical interpretation. It's u minus the displacement q times the force. And this is just a Helmholtz free energy. And so what we have concluded here is that if we try to minimize the internal energy subject to the constraint that the force is a constant, what we're really doing is minimizing the Helmholtz free energy of the system. A second field of application where Lagrange multipliers play an important role is economics. And here I'll just make a note that you are often interested in maximizing the profit. So our objective function is the profit. And the constraint is that the total income is fixed. And so that's zeta. In that case, lambda has a nice economic interpretation. It's a measure of the sensitivity of the profit to a change in the total income. And that's known as marginal cost. Now we can go on to a third and final application of Lagrange multipliers, and that's Lagrangian mechanics. Back to our home. Now we're looking at the action S as an integral of the Lagrangian L. And once again, lambda is equal to the rate of change of the objective function with respect to the constraint variable, but now the objective function is just the Lagrangian. And I haven't shown you how to do it here, but it's true that everything that we did can be taken inside the integral sign. So the bottom line is that the Lagrange multipliers are a measure of the sensitivity of the Lagrangian to a change in one of our constraint variables.
Let's see that. Let's go back to the pendulum problem, written in terms of x and y, and see if the Lagrange multiplier is really what we think it is. Well, we found that the Lagrangian was equal to 1 half ml squared theta dot squared, that was the kinetic energy, plus mgl cosine theta, that was the negative of the potential energy. If we take the derivative of this with respect to our constraint variable, zeta, but remember zeta is equal to L squared, we should get the Lagrange multiplier. Now, what we found in the problem was that lambda was equal to m over 2 times theta dot squared plus mg over 2L times cosine of theta. Go back and look at your notes. This is what we derived for lambda. So what we're thinking is, if we take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to L squared, we should get this expression. That is, we should get lambda. Let's do it. Here's the Lagrangian up above. Take the derivative with respect to L squared, holding theta dot fixed and theta fixed. And in fact, you get lambda. Great, now we know that lambda is equal to the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to L squared. Let me summarize this lecture with a final remark. From the perspectives of geometry, thermodynamics, economics, and classical mechanics, we have seen that our interpretation of the Lagrange multiplier holds. The Lagrange multiplier is a measure of the sensitivity of our objective function with respect to our constraint variable.